remember like for so long I couldn't understand why people weren't engaging with it and I think it's because for so long people have thought of it as an environmental issue which means you know you can sort of draw a circle around it and park it and you don't have to think about it particularly because climate change is a you know it's not an immediate threat like a tiger in the room is it, it doesn't invoke that fight or flight response but then once you understand that it's actually a health issue and once you have people like the World Health Organization saying it's the single greatest health issue we'll ever face that's when you go ah oh. Yeah, it's going to affect me and it's going to affect the people I love and the patients that I'm, you know, professionally, I'm here to look after. That's when you kind of go, oh, you know, this is something that we all need to be involved in. And one of the reasons for starting Pharmacy Declares was we're all here for our patients and we want to make them better. And so if we can make a change in this area, it will impact everything else that's going on around us and all the great work that we've put in. I look around and I see all of the phenomenal work in the NHS. And it's all at risk if we don't tackle climate change. So for anyone who's passionate about anything in their life, if you want it to continue, you know, we have to manage climate change. When I thought about it, I thought, actually, what we really need to get this message across to people are trusted members of society who are great at analysing data and who can communicate health risks to patients or to populations at large. And then when you look around at your pharmacy colleagues, that's exactly who we are. You know, that's us, you know, tick, tick, tick. So that's why I think we are perfectly designed and trained to get this message across to people. Not a pharmacy podcast, remember, though, Tracy. (laughs) To wrap that up, as well as an environmental thing, again, it's a case study in how to influence change. So, Jamie, I'm going to trump you this week because I've got a book. I don't know if you've read it. Um, (laughs) It's called Cascades by Greg Sattel. Yes, I've got him. No. (laughs) So it's a book that looks at sort of movements. It, 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 It looks at sort of where political change has happened and where things have changed and 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 he describes how to create those movements and it is about firstly it's about having a very clear message and so you've got a clear message haven't you you know you had your three points but there's the environmental stuff but it's about that process of being loosely connected you're loosely connecting networks of interested people and so so you, there's lots of networks out there that you're connecting loosely and you've done it through social media and then by by focusing on that message um, that's how change happens there's obviously a lot more to it than that the way you've created a movement in six months that's that's gained such momentum i think is in itself just a great case study in change we were talking about influencing behavior and communicating key issues to people we, we've done that quite a lot but what we've realized is there are lots of different groups in different communities you know like the mums for lungs group are a great example they're concerned about the air pollution in the air we're concerned about our patients we're concerned about protecting the nhs from the effects of climate change and they're all connected and yeah totally it was one of the most beautiful things about this whole process was that everyone sort of joined the dots and everyone was working at it from a different angle the oral apothecary is sponsored by jamie hayes executive coaching and one less pill.com So I think we'll come back to this in the micro discussion in a bit more detail. But I think planetary health is a beautiful term. I've got it. You've absolutely got it over to me in 20 minutes. I love it. So one of the other benefits of coming on the Oral Apothecary podcast, I don't know if you've listened to any of the episodes, Tracy, but... I have, I promise. (laughs) You get to give us three things. And the first one that we always ask is for you to give us a desert island drug. And this is a drug that not to save you on a planet, but something that evokes a powerful memory for you so what would you like to give us as your desert island drug okay so i'm going to give you a drug called zolgensma which is a gene therapy for spinal muscular atrophy and to the best of my knowledge this is the most expensive drug we've ever used in the nhs i think the list price is something like 1.8 million pounds and i've picked it because it is life-changing you know and for me it represents the pinnacle of a therapy for a condition that would have killed um, patients not so long ago and it just represents like the kind of elite level level healthcare that we need to protect and it's this kind of thing that we'll lose if we don't tackle climate change because we'll go into the fight or flight response and you know we think the COVID experience has been bad but this will be swamped if we have to ramp up our efforts to deal with like increasing levels of climate breakdown. One of the things that underpins all of the activity that Pharmacy Declares undertakes is that we're so passionate about healthcare in this country and the level that it's reached and we want to protect everything about it. Wow. That I see what you've done there and it's incredibly clever. And you're not going to believe this, but we have actually mentioned that drug I think when Professor Rachel Elliott was on 
and we were talking about economics and I remember because it was in the news and the boy who had it he was the first person to receive it and there was a long discussion then with Rachel Elliott about how much is something worth and so you you've just really tied that up beautifully in relation to your link back to planetary health I really get that that's very very clever so Zol Gensma I just had to google it while you were talking Zol Gensma the boys know that I'm very particular about the spelling and the naming of drugs so Zol Gensma excellent choice that'll be your pharmacy background uh, steve yeah i know but how many people get it wrong though how many times are we having twitter arguments about whether or not you say the word you use the second syllable to pronounce the drug name but anyway let's move on so that's a great choice tracy absolutely love that okay what about a career anthem then for the oral apothecary spotify playlist ah uh, so this one was actually a really easy one i'm going to pick the music for the london marathon because i ran it in 2015 and i have to say it was one of the highlights of my life it's just one of the best experiences I loved every single second but I think it perfectly describes the process that we need to go to if we're going to look at you know climate change and the ecological crisis because you have people from all walks of life that come together and they have um, support from experts and from their communities and from their families and they're doing something that you know maybe a year or two ago they thought was impossible but you know they've they've shown bravery and courage and really put the effort in to do it and you have all of these people who make personal milestones and they give personal bests and they get the outcome they need you end up with a, a win for the individual and you end up, end up with a win for the community at large um, so yeah um, every time I listen to the music I get shivers down my spine and I just think it's it's perfect for this situation so sorry to ask this question though but what is the music to the London Marathon I don't know is it a song is it a, is it a theme song is it yes just the London Marathon music. You mean the one that they they use on the BBC London yeah, Marathon that's... program? Oh, right, okay. Yes, right. I'm sure there's. I'm sure there's um, a composer. I should. I should no, no, it's it. fine. I don't know. It'll, it's be fine. It'll be there. It'll be on Spotify. Uh, we haven't failed so far. To we've had hymns and all sorts of things, and we've managed to find the pieces of music. So I'm just having a slight under the table. I was like, oh, I don't know where to find that. What, what was your time, Tracy? You can't ask a lady that. No, no, you can. No, it's fine. Um, 4.45 but in my in my defence um, I had my son the year before so um, I was you know I think that was quite good and I beat the man dressed as Jesus so I'm officially faster than the son of God so there you go <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's Ron Goodwin you recognise this famous tune as a theme played every year to introduce TV coverage of the London Marathon in fact it was composed by Ron Goodwin to, to the soundtrack for the 1966 film The Trap okay so here's a useless nugget Ron Goodwin I know because he he also composed a theme tune for the film Battle of Britain, which is one of my favourite theme tunes, and that is on my, that is on my own running playlist. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> oh, there you I go. Have to listen you... to that one. Well, Tracy, you've pleased all the running population that listen to the Oral Apothecary as they tread put the miles in very good okay so yes ron goodwin the music to the london marathon we love that and that's a great link and a great story so thank you very much for that tracy and the last one is a book for listeners for the oral apothecary library what would you like to offer us so i'm going to pick a book called wilding by a lady with this fantastic name her name's isabella tree but it's a true story it's a documentation of a rewilding project that took place a couple of decades ago and it's um, a fantastic Family who took their farm which had been farmed industrially and they decided just to step back and they stopped farming and they stopped using the fertilizers and they just let nature take its course and it's this wonderful description of how when you give nature a chance it recovers and it recovers in ways that you know we're not aware of and we we didn't we don't expect my husband's a manager for the rspb and they're undertaking the same process now at a reserve quite near to us and the, the stories are once you you step back, you have populations of growth of insects and flora and fauna and all the things that we need to survive for planetary health, just making their own merry way into, into areas that have been previously, you know, dead and dying. It's just always great to remember because when you talk about climate change, a lot of the conversations about life and death and it can turn quite serious quite quickly. But what you have to remember, like this whole movement's built around, um, you know, life because we're, it's so important. And if you give it a chance, the environment can help us and help help us recover sounds like a great read so it's wilding by isabella tree it's actually really really uplifting so yeah if you want a fantastic read that to sort of really cheer your mood i totally recommend it okay so thanks for those choices tracy fantastic on to today's micro discussion we're discussing a paper called 
Healthcare's response to climate change, a carbon footprint assessment of the NHS in England. And this was a paper that appeared in The Lancet by Tennyson and a, and a, and a number of other authors. We'll post a link in the show notes. It starts off with a stark warning that climate change threatens to undermine the past 50 years of gains in public health. The paper represents an accountings of the NHS's contribution to greenhouse gases. So some of the findings, in 2019, the health service emissions totaled 25 megatons of carbon dioxide equivalent but actually that's a reduction of 26% since 1990. And it did also show a decrease of 64% in the emissions per inpatient finished episode. The two main culprits from a pharmaceutical point of view seem to be anaesthetic gases and metered dose inhalers. And so the main message seems to be that these are reducing, the impact of these are reducing, but there is still plenty of work to be done. So I don't know what you thought, Tracy. I think you've summed it up beautifully, you know. Amazing work has been done so far. We've reached further than I think any other health service in the world. We've done incredible things, but yeah, there's still so much to do because we're still learning actually. The NHS has taken really strong moves in this. We're the, we were the first health system in the world to set a target for NHS for a net zero. Because it's, it's still so new, we don't have all of the answers. So, you know, we have to reach this target whilst looking after our patients whilst delivering our care and I think one of the best things we can do is understand that it's going to be an iterative process and we're not going to get it right first time um, but that shouldn't stop us trying because this is, is so crucial and there is so much that we can do because medicines account for so much of the NHS's carbon footprint. I think I read it's 25% isn't it and medicines is 25% of the NHS emissions and from within that 25% 3% of it is due to inhalers and 2% is due to anaesthetic gases and the rest of it's from the supply chain that's my understanding uh, from this paper yeah that's correct so obviously supply chain is like supply chain for everybody not not just health and obviously health needs to do its bit and I was quite impressed when I read this I didn't realize they'd been collecting all this data for five years actually there was one thing that really struck me I think it was in this paper because I, did, I, I read around quite a lot because it wasn't something that I was really you know if I'm, I'm being honest with you I uh, hadn't really kind of come to the forefront but one of the stats I thought was really helpful for the listener is that there are 61 million inhalers issued in England and Wales in a year and 71% of those are these metered dose inhalers which is your classic Ventolin the one that if you're ever watching a film and somebody wants to use an inhaler because they've got an asthma attack and they always use it wrong but it's the classic kind of pump inhaler and they're the ones aren't they that have got the worst emissions and we need to try and think about moving away from those and there's a fantastic stat I think it was actually in a paper I read from Prescript where as an example though in Scandinavia there's only 10 to 30 Thirty percent of their inhalers are this type of pump inhaler and in Europe it's less than 50 so actually we still use a lot don't we of that type of inhaler and it's the challenge and me working in primary care it's the challenge of how do we do that isn't it and bring the patients with us and give them the option as well as what might need a bit of titration I suppose and I think that's one of the challenges isn't it? Oh absolutely I mean I've been um, speaking to some respiratory experts as you can imagine because this is such a hot topic. The key message that everyone's so keen to get across is that you know this can't be us telling the patients what they can have this has to be something that you know the patients buy into as well because we you know we've got the Scandinavian example and we know that patients can be really well managed without large quantities of these metered dose inhalers but we need to make the transition at a pace that the patient's can find acceptable. One thing that I've always been told whenever I speak to a respiratory expert is that the patient with the highest carbon footprint is one that's not managed and has to come into hospital. So, you know, that's obviously a terrible personal tragedy, but from a, a carbon point of view, it, there are no wins either. So That was my thought after reading the paper and, haven't, and also having been involved in some discussions over the last couple of months around a strategy for improving the carbon footprint of inhalers is I think we've got a history of pharmacy in, in medicines and we have of, of switching in the past with similar issues one of the approaches we've done is almost indiscriminate switching my worry is is we could be on a path to sort of just simply saying right everyone on Ventolin is switched over to I forget what the, the environmentally friendly version is Salmol Salmol and then next week GSK suddenly make Ventolin the cheaper and more environmentally friendly version and everyone switches back you've hit the nail on the head the real issue here is is about adherence and making sure that obviously the choice of inhaler is suitable but I've seen some figures and I, these recycling projects that they've looked at like people are returning half full inhalers we all know that when we go into people's homes there's always boxes of inhalers everywhere it's just a worry for me that a very well sort of intentioned sort of plan could be to just switch people whereas 
we can't take our eye off the adherence and medicines management aspect of it. The way to decarbonise healthcare is not to think of it in terms of one single project or one single item. You know, you have to think about the system as a whole, which is exactly what we do with, you know, medicines optimization anyway. I think what's going to happen is it's going to be a gradual rollout of information to health professionals and to patients so that everyone 